Okay. <clears throat> Let's get started because uh, I have to finish at 10 too. <clears throat> So feel free to email me if you have any questions about any of this. I mean, it's fairly straightforward, but you know, <clears throat> you can either come up and see me or just email me. So we're now going to transition to T cells. Um, like I said before, it's, <clears throat> it's quite difficult to segregate T cells and B cells involved in each other's lives, but we're going to look at T cells in more detail now. <clears throat> so by the end of this, um, We'll have looked at T cell development, which occurs in the thymus. <clears throat> and there's several steps. There's what's called positive selection and negative selection, where most of those T cells actually die. <laughs> Oftentimes, they talk about the thymus as being a, as a, like a school, you know, where the T cells get educated and they come out with their diplomas. You know, but that's actually not the way it is at all. It's actually more brutal than that. Most of the T cells that go into the thymus never make it out. So they make it out, they go to the, what's called the periphery. Uh, <clears throat> we'll look at some of the defects in T cell development that lead to human disease. Um, T cells are important because they orchestrate everything, as you'll see. We're going to look at the MHC. We touched on the MHC briefly in the capacity of uh, you know, antigen-presenting molecules to T cells. Uh, <clears throat> and then the importance again, I guess that's a redundant Thing. Uh, and then we're going to look at sort of clinical aspects of, uh, of the MHC. The MHC was actually discovered as being important in graft rejection. So we're going to look at graft rejection, although that's not what it evolved to do. You know, it just is a, is a consequence uh, of, of transplanting uh, grafts. So as you'll have seen, the T cell receptor is actually quite similar to, to the B cell receptor. There's a B cell receptor. Actually, this is the secreted version. And as I mentioned earlier, the T cell receptor um, looks very similar to the, the, um, the, the FAB fragment of an antibody in size. In fact, if I showed you the crystal structure of the two, you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And the reason they're similar is because they, you know, they come from this, a common lymphoid pre precursor, and they're, they're, they're part of the Ig superfamily. There's lots of um, proteins that belong to the Ig superfamily, not just antigen receptors, but this, you know, over over. Evolution, we've, we've generated a whole variety of adhesion molecules that are all very uh, closely related. You know, they have the same domain structure as, as an immunoglobulin. Um, <clears throat> T cells and B cells have variable and constant domains, just like an antibody does. There's a variable domain at the top, and there's a constant domain. Um, in the T cell receptor, they're called alpha and beta. Most of, most of the T cell receptors are called alpha-beta receptors because they have an alpha chain and a beta chain. But there are some gamma-delta T cells, which we're not going to look at today, but those, those are found mostly in the gut. Um, and the enzymes that, 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 that do the, the combination or the gene rearrangements are the same enzymes that are involved in the <coughs> B cell gene rearrangement. So those are the similarities, but there are some major differences. Uh, the first thing is that this is a signaling receptor only. Okay, it, it doesn't, uh, it, you know, it, all it does is it signal. It's not secreted. It doesn't undergo somatic hypermutation. It doesn't go undergo class switching. Any of that stuff. It's, a, it's solely a signaling receptor. And the other major difference <coughs> is that it is not able to recognize free antigen like a B cell. You remember the B cell can bind whole antigen. Um, either on the surface of the B cell or when the antibody is secreted. A T cell has to, um, can only recognize processed antigen. That antigen has to be chopped up into peptides, and that, those peptides have to be presented to it on the surface of what's called an antigen-presenting cell, APC. <clears throat> and it does that in the context of a molecule encoded in the MHC. So the T cell receptor recognizes antigen peptide plus an MHC molecule. Okay, so that's a major difference between uh, the T cell receptor and the B cell receptor. So we looked at some markers of B cells. Let's look at some markers of T cells. Um, so the best markers we have are what's called CD4 and CD8. I don't know if you've heard of those, but CD4 
Uh, so this is a CD4 positive T cell. And you'll see that there's a CD4 molecule and it actually um, helps the T cell receptor bind to the MHC. Um, and this is very dogmatic. A, 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 um, a CD4 cell will only recognize antigen in the context of what's called a class two MHC. And CD8 is the other major marker. T cells are either CD4 or CD8. So CD4 recognizes antigen in the context of class two. CD8 T cells recognize antigen in the context of a class one MHC molecule. So try and remember that. That's, that's immunological dogma, okay? You never, see, you never see CD4 cells binding to class one and vice versa. This is, this is the only way. And so those CD4 and CD8 molecules are called co-receptors because they, they do also bind to the MHC. So you can see in this diagram, the CD4 is binding to the side of the MHC molecule. And CD8 does the same thing. It binds to the, the side of the MHC molecule. And it helps increase the <coughs> avidity of the cellular interaction. Now, I said that they're either one or the other, but the, the, the only exception to this is in the thymus, when we look at T cell development, we'll see there's a double positive stage. DP stage, double positive. Um, they have CD4 and CD8. And, and as they develop, they become single positive, they become one or the other. Other, other useful markers are the, <clears throat> the signaling components of the T cell receptor, receptor complex. We'll look in a, a second. So there are several chains and it's collectively termed CD3, which is a bit confusing really because there's actually several uh, signaling molecules associated with the T cell receptor, but collectively it's termed CD3. And other markers you, you'll have You'll have heard of CD40 ligand, remember that one? That's the one that provides co-stimulation to um, B cells. And then another one is CD28, which is found on activated T cells. So these are useful T cell markers. So there's the, a diagram of the <coughs> T cell receptor. Um, <coughs> so this is, these are the alpha and beta chains, and there are several um, uh, chains associated with it. We've got, and they're all signaling molecules. So here's CD3. So you can see there are actually four chains in this diagram, and they're collectively co called CD3. So you've got an epsilon chain, a delta chain, a gamma chain, and another epsilon chain. And all of these, oh, and there's another chain which is mostly intracellular, very little of it sticking out of the cell, and that's called zeta. So all of these um, signaling uh, proteins have these ITAMs. It's immunoreceptor, uh, or sorry, interest. I thought it was immunoreceptor. I've got intracellular tyrosine kinase activation mode. I think it's immunoreceptor uh, tyrosine activation motif. Anyway, these are the these are the uh, the regions of the signaling molecules that get phosphorylated, and that's uh, an important first step in the activation pathway. So there's the T cell receptor complex. It's only function is signaling. So let's look at what these CD4 cells and CD8 cells are like. So CD4 cells <coughs> come in various uh, different uh, flavors, if you like. These, all, these are all CD4 positive cells, so they all recognize antigen in the context of class 2 MHC molecule. But there are different subsets. <coughs> so we've got T helper ones or TH1 cells. We've got TH2 cells. TH17, for many years we just thought there was TH1s and TH2s. Recently, TH17s were discovered. And the reason they're called 17 and not TH3 is because they secrete IL interleukin 17. Um, we've got uh, another one that was recently described in detail, a T follicular helper cells. Those, <coughs> those are found in the germinal centers and help B cells make antibodies. And then we've got uh, another category here called T regs, or regulatory T cells. Uh, and those actually turn off the response to uh, by other T cells. They're kind of immunosuppressive T cells. And those you find all um, active all the time. They're, they're the ones that help maintain uh, our tolerance to our own antigens, and, and you know they, they suppress autoimmune disease. That will p play part of the role in suppressing autoimmune. So often, if there's a dysregulation of T regs, you often see the emergence of autoimmune diseases. So what are these? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but um, TH1 cells are very important for helping macrophages kill intracellular bacteria. So if you, if you have a, 
um, a macrophage that's ingested some bacteria. It, it, it likes to get a, a cytokine from a Th1 cell. This is a signature cytokine of Th1 cells. It's called gamma interferon. And when a macrophage gets a hit of gamma interferon, it can then undergo what's called a respiratory burst. I think you may have heard about that in the innate lectures. But it's a way for the macrophage to start making all of these reactive oxygen intermediates like hydrogen peroxide and superoxide anion and things like that. And those are very toxic to intracellular. So the Th1 cell, its function is to help macrophages kill ingested bacteria. Um, Th2 cells, they, they play a big role in hel helminth, uh, you know, helminth worms immunity too. So IL-4, remember, is a, a cytokine that's produced by Th2 cells. And IL-4 in induces um, antibody production. Uh, uh, IgE is, is the, one of the major antibodies that's induced by Th2 cells. And those IgE antibodies will bind to the surface of, of helminth parasites. <clears throat> and, and it just so happens that mast cells have uh, IgE receptors, FC receptors for IgE. And so those will degranulate when they come across parasite worm, you know, covered in IgE. And those mast cells release things like histamine, smooth muscle, muscle contraction to expel the worm. Um, and also uh, they, they produce a lot of mucus as well. So IL-13 is very important for production of mucus in, in the gut. So, so together, the, you know, the Th2 cells are mainly involved in um, <clears throat> immunity against parasites. The follicular T helper follicular cells, these are the ones that help feed B cells make antibodies. And we heard about that uh, in the first lecture. So, so these, are the, these are very important for, for helping B cells make uh, various antibodies. And then Th17s play a role in uh, immunity to um, infections in the gut. OK, so, so the take home there is that there's lots of different types of CD4 cells. CD8 cells, on the other hand, are very limited. There's really only one uh, subset, and these are what we call cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And they kill uh, virus-infected cells or tumor cells. Uh, and they do that by releasing uh, components inside the granules. You'll see a, a CD8 T cell. The, the granules have been labeled red there, and you, they, they contain things like perforin, and as the name suggests, perforin makes little holes in the membrane. It perforates it much in the same way as, you remember in complement, the, the, <clears throat> the membrane attack complex and makes these holes in the membrane uh, of, of, the, of the bacterium. And then things like granzymes can get in to the, the infected cell uh, and that triggers apoptosis. So this, this is a little movie here. You'll see, what you'll see is the, um, the first you'll see that the granules will move to the interface between the T cell and uh, the tumor cell, which in this case is the antigen presenting cell. And then this tumor cell will start blebbing because it's undergoing apoptosis. So blebbing is where the cell sort of breaks up into, into blebs and then they can be internalized. So you see all the, all the little red granules move to the interface and now the, the tumor cell is blebbing because uh, it's undergoing apoptosis and it's dying. So. <clears throat> So I mentioned this happens in the thymus. Uh, we've already seen something of the B cell development pathway this morning. So now we're going to look at the T cell pathway. And again, they're descended from the same common lymphoid precursor as B cells, but they diverge and go down this pathway and they rearrange <coughs> their T cell receptor genes. They don't rearrange their B cell receptor genes. So T cells start as hemopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus. So, so the thymus is that organ in, in the upper chest, lies just above the heart. And that's where the T cell undergoes um, its uh, T cell receptor gene rearrangements and acquires its mature phenotype. And then once it's done that, if it survives the processes in, in the thymus, it then leaves the thymus and does much the same as the B cell. It, it circulates around the, the body uh, in, the, in, the, in the circulatory system, trafficking through these secondary lymphoid tissues. The thymus is considered a primary lymphoid tissue, much like the bone marrow is the primary lymphoid tissue for, B for T cells, it's the thymus. But once, once it's matured and exits the periphery, it starts to traffic through these secondary lymphoid tissues. So lymph nodes, spleen, and GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissues. 
So the thymus is quite interesting. It's actually derived from both endoderm and ectoderm. And it first starts to develop very early in uh, gestation, in the, the sixth week, the endodermal lining of the third pharyngeal pouch. So this is the outside of the, of the fetus. And it, you, you'll see these little um, clefts forming. And then on the inside, in the pharyngeal pouches, you start to get um, the third pharyngeal pouch starts to invaginate and becomes encircled entirely by the ectoderm. And eventually, the <coughs> um, by about day 56, the thymic enlarge, as it's called, uh, breaks away from, from the endoderm. So it has, has endoderm, endodermally derived cells in the middle and, and then ectodermally derived cells on the outside. So it's quite an interesting organ because it has this dual embryonic origin. And once, and of course, obviously, they then fuse together because you have one on each side of the larynx. <coughs> and that organ then, which is essentially just epithelial cells, becomes populated by bone marrow cells. So T, T, T cell uh, precursors and dendritic cells and, and other uh, cells of, of hemopoietic origin. So the thymus continues to enlarge during fetal development, development and, and persists until puberty and then starts to involute, starts to sort of shrink in size uh, in adulthood. Um, <clears throat> so this is what the, the thymus looks like. There's actually lobes. This is a thymic lobe separated by these trabeculae. So the outer region is called the, the cortex. That's the, the ectodermally derived region. And then down in the bottom here, we've got the, the medulla, which is endodermally derived. And you'll see um, in the cortex, it's actually chock full of developing, developing thymocytes. They're called thymocytes because they're not mature T cells yet. And you can see in this, I guess this is a freeze etch electron micrograph or a scanning EM. You can see these stromal cells um, that form the sort of the parenchyma of the thymus, and then in between you've got these numerous uh, thymocytes undergoing uh, replication. So we have the cortical layer is epithelially derived, and then you've got the, the thymocytes in blue, which are bone marrow derived, and then underneath that you've got um, epithelially derived medulla epithelial cells. And then you've got these dendritic cells. These are the different kind of dendritic cells I was mentioning. These are not the follicular dendritic cells. These are bone marrow derived dendritic cells that play a key role in, in uh, T cell development. And then you've also got macrophages as well. So the processes that, un that, that occur inside the, the thymus are the T cell receptor gene rearrangement. Uh, and then we have positive selection and followed by negative selection. And those, as we'll see, are very important in shaping the repertoire of <coughs> those T cells. We don't want any auto-reactive T cells. Remember, they produce a huge repertoire of billions of receptors, and what we have to do is weed out the ones that are no good. Um, I'm not going to go in this in any detail, but essentially the, the T cell re gene rearrangement process, just like the B cell receptor, produces a vast repertoire uh, of, of receptors. In fact, if you look at the alpha-beta T cell receptor repertoire around 10 to the 18, it's, it's quite a bit bigger th even than the Ig. Uh, receptor repertoire. So a vast number of receptors. And the process is very, very similar. We've got uh, on the bottom there, we've got the germline configuration of the, of the beta. Uh, and then on the top, we've got the germline configuration of the alpha chain. And you'll see it's essentially the same thing. You get, uh, you get a, an alpha, uh, variab variable alpha gene segment being combined with the adjoining segment. The alpha chain only has, uh, it's a bit like the light chain of immunoglobulin, it only has variable and joining gene segments, whereas the, <clears throat> the beta chain is a bit like the heavy chain of immunoglobulin, composed of three, so it has both the variable, the diversity, and the joining. So each one, of, each one of those three or two, depending on which chain, is selected randomly and then brought together by that rearrangement process. So you have the rearranged configuration shown there, and then Finally, they come together when the proteins are expressed as a, an alpha, beta, uh, T cell receptor. So the process in the thymus starts with these what are called double negative cells. So they don't have CD4 or CD8. They arrive in the thymus as um, thymocytes that are double negative thymocytes. The beta chain is rearranged first. And much in the same way as the B cell receptor, it's expressed on the cell surface with a surrogate uh, alpha chain. 
It's called pre-T alpha. So you have the beta chain that's, that's generated by gene rearrangement, and then that's expressed with a, with a surrogate called the pre-T alpha chain. Uh, and if that actually encounters an MHC molecule that, that, um, that it binds to, then this, the, the T cell receptor is allowed to signal into the cell, and that's like a survival signal for that phimocyte. And the first thing it does, it starts to express CD4 and CD8. So if you get a successful rearrangement <coughs> of the beta chain, which allows the, the T cell to signal, it will then express CD4 and CD8. So you then have a double positive stage. Then the alpha chain rearranges, uh, and then um, it goes through these processes of what's called positive selection and, and negative selection. So <coughs> that, that receptor that's generated, obviously if it doesn't bind uh, to, to the MHC that's available, then that phimocyte dies. But as long as it has some kind of interaction, it doesn't have to be very strong, it will survive and then undergo positive followed by uh, negative selection. So that process of, uh, of survival is called positive selection, okay? And that's entirely dictated by whether the receptor that it generates is able to recognize that and available to it in, in the thymus. So part of this positive selection process is then determining whether it becomes a CD4 single positive or a CD8 single positive. And again, that's really um, dependent on which kind of MHC molecule is available. Uh, or, or which kind of MHC molecule is recognized by the T cell receptor. So here are double positives. This T cell receptor is binding to an MHC1 molecule, okay? So that then loses CD4 expression and becomes a CD8 single positive. So if, it, if the T cell receptor has its natural affinity for one, it becomes a CD8 cell. And conversely, if the T cell receptor that's generated has an affinity for class two, it becomes a CD4 T cell. Remember, CD4 cells recognize class 2 MHC, C8 T cells recognize class 1 MHC. So that's, that's part of the positive selection process that determines whether it becomes a CD4 or a CD4. So the next step is called negative selection. And that really uh, is dictated by the affinity of the interaction. And as a rule, if it's um, a very strong interaction, those T cells are, are killed off. So the high, the high affinity, sorry, avidity. Avidity is a, a combination of, of affinity of the receptor uh, and how many receptors are involved. So it's, it's basically uh, a combination of two, two things. But high, high avidity interactions means that, that, is, that that's too strong and the T cell is, is eliminated. Because you, you don't want that T cell to, to emerge into the periphery because it will cause auto disease, all right? It'll start attacking all self tissue. Um, if it's too weak, then the, the, the T cell is switched off. And what you're looking for is an affinity, which actually has been measured in the lab. You know, you the affinity of the interaction. But there's a small, narrow window of affinity where that, where that T cell um, survives. If it's too weak, it's, it's, it's switched off or becomes anergic or paralyzed, whatever word you want to use. If it's too strong, that T cell undergoes apoptosis. So what you're left with um, <clears throat> are T cells that um, bind with sort of moderate affinity to the MHC, probably not enough to cause autoimmune disease. And what's important is there's a gene called uh, AIRE or AIR, the autoimmune regulator gene. This is a gene that's expressed <clears throat> in epithelial cells in the medulla. Uh, and that gene allows all kinds of different antigens, self antigens to be expressed. These are antigens that are found <clears throat> in various sites in the body. And so those are expressed on those um, medullary epithelial cells, and those help screen out any auto-reactive T cells, you know, that might recognize self-antigen. And this, 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 this um, deletion can occur at any point, <clears throat> at pretty much any, any point in, in the thymus. It can occur on the cortical epithelial cells, it can occur in the medullary epithelial cells, or it can occur on the um, the bone marrow derived dendritic cells. The upshot of which is if, if that affinity is too great, then those cells will die. So they're really running the gauntlet as they kind of move down through the thymus. And like I said, it's a very, um, uh, it's fairly brutal. Only 2% of those T cells actually make it to, to, to 
to enter into the periphery. It's not a, it's not a perfect system. Uh, the idea is obviously you want to remove all of the auto-reacted T cells so that the ones are left behind and escape. But those are the ones that will recognize other antigens, you know, including hopefully antigens from pathogens. Um, <clears throat> it's an imperfect process because we still have autoimmune disease. And so there's obviously some, some mechanisms that are failing in those diseases. But the, the, I guess the take home is that we, the repertoire that's released into the periphery, it's depleted of self-reactive cells. The, the remaining ones will react with foreign. And it also means that those T cells um, are called MHC, self-MHC restricted. That means to say they will only respond to antigen if it's presented to it in an MHC molecule that they encountered in the thymus. Okay? Which is normally what they will do anyway. But you know, when we do tissue transplantation, we actually get something very strange happening, which we'll come to. So, so there's a called self-MHC restriction. Okay, and I mentioned that the thymus involute uh, with age. So there's a section through a three-day-old thymus, and by 70 years of age, you've pretty much lost the thymus. So the big difference between the T and the B cell compartments are T cell development <coughs> does not continue throughout the lifetime. It uh, starts to uh, sort of wind down at puberty. Okay, we're going to look at the MHC. Remember this... <coughs> This is something that's intimately associated with T cell recognition. So the, the MHC, or major histocompatibility complex, <clears throat> it's encoded on, on chromosome 6. Uh, it's, uh, there's about 224 genes in total in the MHC. And it's about uh, 3.6 megabases, million base pairs of DNA. So it's a fairly large complex. And it encodes um, the the chains required for class 1 and class 2 MHC molecules. But there's also, not shown on here, there's lots of other genes in the MHC that, are, that have various roles in antigen processing and presentation. Okay, so <clears throat> this is called the, the major histocompatibility complex, about 220 genes. So the, the real function of these MHC molecules, despite the fact that they also <coughs> have a big role in graft rejection, the main function is to present antigens to MHC. So there are two, like I said, there are two MHC molecules, MHC1. This has a, an alpha chain, which is encoded in the MHC. Then it has this other chain called beta-2 microglobulin, which is encoded somewhere else. The MHC2 molecules have uh, two equally sized chains called an alpha chain and a beta chain. Okay, and they're both encoded in the MHC. So there's a bit of a difference there, just... just uh, the alpha chain is encoded in the MHC for class 1, whereas both alpha and beta chains for class 2. So the function, obviously, as I mentioned, is to um, present antigenic peptides to T cell, uh, to, to T -cell receptors. Um, and if, if you remember, I, I mentioned this dogma, MHC1 presents uh, antigen to CD4 T cells, and MHC2 <coughs> presents antigen to CD4 cells. Did I say MHC1 passes, presents to CD8, C, MHC2 to CD4? This is what they actually look like. This is the kind of T cell receptors I view of the MHC molecule. This is the crystal structures. And you'll see that <clears throat> the MHC molecule has these two alpha helices that kind of sit on a platform of beta strands. And the antigenic peptide <clears throat> sits inside that cleft. Um, so the, the red thing there is a, is a peptide um, that's sitting in an MHC molecule there, around eight or nine amino acids long, whereas the T cell, ep these are called epitopes. Remember we talked about epitopes for antibodies? Those are the, those patches on the surface of the antigen recognized. In the case of a T cell, the epitope is a, a peptide. So the, the, the T cell epitope presented by class two is a bit longer than a class one peptide. It's about 15 or so amino acids. So we're going to look at how those peptides get into those MHC molecules. And there's actually two pathways. <coughs> and we're going to look at the, the MHC2 pathway first. So MHC2 pathways, um, pathway loads its peptide binding cleft with antigens, peptide antigens derived from extracellular antigens. So, so here's an extracellular antigen. It could be a bacterium, for example, being taken up inside the antigen-presenting cell and then 
in that endosomal compartment, there's all these enzymes. It's very low pH. There's, there's uh, lots of proteolytic enzymes that cleave the material into, into peptides. At the same time, down here, we have a, a class two <coughs> MHC molecule that's being uh, expressed in the, in the endoplasmic reticulum. It has these membrane, transmembrane domains that you know, embeds it into the membrane. Those class two molecules are exported to the cell surface, but not before they kind of intercept those peptides that are being taken down into the cell en route to the lysosome. <coughs> and those peptides, are, if, if they bind to the MHC molecule, will be picked up by the MHC class two molecule and then displayed on the surface. Now, there's a, there's a couple of things you need to know. One is that these MHC class two molecules are not found everywhere. They're only found on what are called professional antigen presenting cells, professional APC. And those comprise dendritic cells. These are the bone marrow derived dendritic cells. Macrophages and B cells are the only cells in the body that express class two. And <coughs> the dendritic cells have an even more special function. Those are the only cell type of the three that can activate a naive T cell, a naive T CD4 T cell. So the activation of these T cells is incredibly stringent. It has to be controlled by uh, another cell. And the dendritic cell, as you'll remember from your innate lectures, is kind of on the interface between the innate system and the adaptive system. And their function is to um, take up antigens and present them to CD4 cells. The other pathway is uh, <coughs> slightly different. So this is the class one MHC processing pathway. And those get loaded with antigens that start off not outside the cell, but inside the cell. So those could be, you know, virus, virally expressed antigens if you have an infected cell. Uh, it could be a tumor antigen, tumor cells express antigen. In fact, healthy cells express antigens. So MHC molecules are basically displaying all the antigen itself as well as anything that's foreign that uh, starts out life within the cell. You know, it has to be <coughs> transcribed and translated from from DNA or RNA inside the cell. And those, those proteins, those self or foreign proteins are chopped up by this thing called the proteasome inside the cytoplasm. That's a big multi-enzyme complex that's function inside the cell is to chop, chop proteins up. And those proteins get transported in to the, um, the, the endoplasmic reticulum where they find these newly synthesized class one MHC molecules. <clears throat> they don't bind to class two because class two actually has peptide binding cleft to block it. So those peptides, if they bind, they'll, they'll find their way into the, the cleft of the MHC1 molecule and it makes it onto the cell surface. Okay, so MHC1 molecules are interesting because they're found on all nucleated cells. They're not restricted to professional APCs, they're on all nucleated cells. And if you think about it, that makes sense because a nucleated cell can become virus infected, it can be a, you know, it can become a tumor cell. And those cells you want to be able to kill. So remember, class one presents antigen to CD8 cells, and CD8 cells are the killer cells, the cytotoxic T cells that kill either tumor cells or infected cells. So class one you'll find everywhere because every cell in the body needs to be killed if necessary, uh, whereas class two <coughs> um, is very tightly controlled by being expressed on only certain cell types. So those are the professional APCs we talked about, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. The take home message from this, really, I, all I want you to remember is, is down here <coughs> that the dendritic cells are the only cell of the three that can activate a naive T cell. So what about these other two, the macrophages and the B cells? Well, we've seen this before. This is the macrophage. <coughs> the macrophage is an antigen presenting cell. It has class two on the surface. So it will, it will take up extracellular pathogens, you know, extracellular antigen like bacteria, in this case mycobacter, broken down into uh, peptides and then those peptides are presented on the surface of the macrophage in the context of a class two MHC molecule. So along comes a, 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 a T cell that's already been activated by a dendritic cell. That T cell will be a Th1 helper cell and that will recognize the antigen displayed on the surface in the context of class two. It releases gamma interferon and that allows that macrophage to kill the intracellular bacteria. 
Okay, so, so macrophages need to express class two because they need help from helper T cells to kill the intracellular bacteria. The other one is the B cell. <coughs> this is actually very important because you don't want B cells making antibodies willy-nilly, you know, they've got to be uh, tightly controlled. And so B cells are also antigen-presenting cells. So um, on the right side there, you can see a B cell. It's, it's got its membrane-bound B cell receptor. It's, it's acquired an antigen. In this case, it looks like a virus binding to the antigen, say the hemagglutinin, you know, if it's flu, binding to the antigen on the surface of the virus. That then gets, that signals the cell to take up the antigen inside the endosomal compartment. And the whole that gets chopped up, like we talked about. And then that gets picked up, those peptides get picked up by the class two and then expressed on the surface, okay? So that's a B cell, but before that B cell can make antibody, it needs help from the T cells. So it's, it's displaying its peptides in class two and it requires a, a follicular helper T cell. So here's a, here's a <coughs> The, the helper T cell that's required. It's being activated by that dendritic cell. Only the dendritic cells can do this. But it's, it's picking up the same virus, okay? So the same antigen, but this is, this is being processed and presented in the context of class two in exactly the same way that the B cell is doing it. Now you've got the T cell has been activated. You've got the B cell that's displaying the, 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 the epitope. And then those two cells will get together. So on the bottom here, you've got the B cell. And on the top, you've got the follicular helper T cell. That T cell recognizes that same peptide that it was activated against by the dendritic cell. That B cell then receives help, you know, from the T cell in the form of co-stimulation. There's the co-stimulation and then the cytokines that it will produce. And then that B cell will then go ahead and produce antibody. So that's actually a very clever way of making sure that the T cell and the B cell uh, get together. Those, that B cell and that T cell both recognize the same antigen and, and that, that what's called cognate recognition ensures that the, um, that the antibody, sorry, the T cell delivers the help to the correct B cell. You know, the, the, the helper cell only delivers help to the correct uh, B cell that produces antibody to the same antigen that it recognizes. You get that? All right, so the MHC uh, is extremely polymorphic. And this is, we've seen the way the antigen receptors are very diverse. Obviously, the reason to do that is so that they can recognize a, a universe of different uh, antigens. The MHC is gone, has to do the same thing. It has to be able to present um, peptide epitopes from a, a, a huge uh, variety of different pathogens. And the way it's decided to do it is by becoming polymorphic. But what that means is that there are lots of, in the human population, there are lots of different alleles of these MHC molecules. So <clears throat> in the MHC, the class two MHC molecules, remember only the alpha chain is encoded, sorry, both alpha and beta chain is encoded in the, in the MHC. Uh, and so there are actually three uh, class two molecules. Let me start with class one, it's a bit easier. So class one has um, that heavy chain, the alpha chain, which is encoded in the MHC. And there are three uh, class one loci called HLA, A, B, and C. We call it HLA, human leukocyte antigen. So the human MHC is called HLA. And there are three class one loci, and only the, only the alpha chain is encoded in the MHC. But the important thing is there's, if you look in the human population, there are thousands of different alleles, different, slightly different variants of the same um, uh, gene. And the same, same with MH2, both uh, uh, alpha and the beta chains of MHT, MHC are encoded in, the, in uh, class two MHC are encoded in the, in the, in the complex. But the, 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 the number of alleles, the, the amount of polymorphism seems to be restricted. But again, there's, there's hundreds or thousands of different alleles in the population. And in fact, the, a typical haplotype, so that the, the, the particular alleles that you inherit it's called a haplotype, an MHC haplotype, okay? And the, the particular combination of alleles that you inherit depends uh, on what your parents have. And that, so, uh, you know, I have HLA A01 and A. You'll notice that they're both expressed. There's no, there's no dominance here. They're both co-dominantly expressed. So I express both maternal and paternal uh, A alleles. 
I express both B alleles, so HLA B08 and B44, and then HLA DR. There's, so ABC are the class one, DP, DQ, and DR are the class two molecules. And so the, the important ones I've, I've shown there with the red rings. So uh, for the for the HLA DR, I express uh, B103. So that's a, that's a you know that's my haplotype. It'll be completely different to yours, and and that unless you have an identical twin, the, the particular MHC haplotype you inherit is unique. Okay. So that poly polymorphism that we, <coughs> that we uh, talk about, all of that polymorphism localizes to the, the cleft. We don't have to go into this in too much detail, but if you look at um, class one or class two molecules, these little red blobs are locations within the sequence where you find these differences. The rest of the molecule is essentially the same. It's just that the, the differences that, the, that lead to these polymorphisms are all localized in the, in the peptide binding cleft, which makes sense because that's the region uh, that you want to be able to bind different peptides. In fact, these MHC molecules are very promiscuous. They're not specific at all, not like an antigen receptor. They, they're actually very promiscuous and they can, they can present one of thousands of different peptides. Okay, and in fact, polymorphism has been driven over this, you know, the millennia by <coughs> by natural selection, because usually there's a, there's one or more particular alleles that confer protection to a particular pathogen. You know, if it's say the you know bubonic plague, if you have a certain MHC allele that bond to that pathogen, you'll likely survive, and you know you'll be able to pass those genes on to the next generation. So this huge polymorphism is because each of those alleles at some point has had a, an important role in a particular uh, infection. And in fact, if you look in HIV, for example, where there's a lot of variation going on at the same time within, within an individual that's infected, the, the more MHC molecules they have, the better they are at fighting infection. So this is a little figure here that shows the percentage of HIV infected individuals who remain AIDS free. And, and the ones that are the most polymorphic are, are in red, whereas the ones that, that are least polymorphic are in blue. And so your survival against HIV um, is also uh, dependent on how, how polymorphic you are at the MHC. So it was first discovered, I mean, um, it was first discovered using uh, skin transplants. So in mice, you can, you can generate genetically identi identical uh, strains of mice. So if you take, um, you know, if you, if you do lots of crossbreeding, you can wind up with strains that are histo-compatible, uh, which means that if you take a, <clears throat> a skin transplant from one that's we'll just call MHCA, transplanted into another animal that's MHCA, that's, that skin graft survives. You know, it's considered, <coughs> it's considered um, syngeneic. The word is syngeneic. So if they have identical MHCs, those, those grafts will be tolerated. If you take a, a, a graft from a, a different, uh, from the same strain of mouse and put it into a, another strain of mouse that has a different MHC, different MHC alleles, um, it doesn't survive. It, it's, it's very quickly rejected by the, by the recipient. <coughs> and then um, there's a kind of an intermediate state where you can take um, graft from, from one strain, and, and in this particular case, we're taking uh, a, a transplant from a male and transplanting it into the same strain, but a female of that strain. Uh, so they're almost identical, except, you know, um, the male will have the X chromosome, so there'll be some antigens encoded on the X chromosome that will be presented um, in its MHC molecule. So those are called minor histocompatibility. So if you, if you have if you have identical MHC, but the background, you know, the other genes in the genome are, are different, then you, you get a, a state of, um, uh, you can get rejection. But it's not as fast as a completely allogeneic graft. It's kind of uh, intermediate there. And that's because that's, those antigens that are in the background that are different are presented by MHC molecules in the conventional fashion. So that female will reject um, male grafts because there are male antigen peptides that are being presented uh, in its MHC molecule. Even though the MHC is compatible, the, the background is different, so there'll be some foreign peptides going on. Uh, so there's a, another example. You can actually have, 
strains of mice that share the same MHC but have completely different backgrounds. So again, that, those are called minor histocompatibility antigens. So if, if you get graft rejection, it's simply because you get, say, um, if you transplant a kidney, if there's any um, dendritic cells remaining inside that, that, that tissue, it will then migrate to the lymph node, and that's where T cell activation goes on. And if, it, if, you, if they're allogeneic <coughs> uh, dendritic cells, those T cells, it, it's a different kind of recognition to the conventional peptide-based recognition that, that's used for recognizing uh, foreign pathogens. But it's a, it generates a very vigorous T cell response. And those T cells can then you know, go back into the, the, the um, transplanted tissue uh, and, um, and can ultimately lead to the destruction of the tissue. So the, the way that tissue grafts are, uh, are done is you, you want to try and, obviously, you want to match the MHC as, as closely as possible. You're not going to get a complete match unless you have a, you know, an identical twin who can donate a kidney or something. Usually, you just match the major... Uh, molecules like HLA, A, B, C, and DR. Um, <clears throat> and then you use a, that as well as a, a mixture of immunosuppressive drugs to, to try and tone down the, the immune system to, to prevent rejection. So those are the, those are the typical uh, drugs that are used. So it's a combination of tissue matching and immunosuppressive uh, drugs. One last thing uh, is kind of the reciprocal. This is where, the, where the, the graft can actually try and reject the host. It's called graft versus host disease. And this often, um, this can often occur with bone marrow transplants. Bone marrow transplants are widely used now for uh, treatment of uh, various um, hemopoietic cell disorders such as lymphomas and leukemias. Am I doing on time? Okay. Um, and usually the donor will receive, sorry, the recipient will receive uh, radiation therapy first, uh, and then will receive a graft of matched or closely matched bone marrow uh, cells. Uh, and again, the problem is that those, those cells that are transfused into the recipient may contain um, uh, T cells that recognize the <coughs> allogeneic MHC molecules in the donor, so in the recipient. So those, those T cells um, can get into the lymph node where they're activated against MHC molecules on the dendritic cells inside the lymph, lymph nodes. Those, those graft-derived T cells can then go back into the circulation. Uh, and those donor T cells will attack the recipient's allogeneic tissues. And a lot of the symptoms of this are um, lesions in the skin, uh, in, and in the liver and in the intestines. And there's symptoms there, nausea, vomiting, and so on and so forth. Uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the symptoms is this macro, um, maculopapular rash over the, over the skin, which is a kind of diagnostic of graft versus hosties. Again, of course, we want to try and avoid this by HLA matching. Uh, and uh, you can actually deplete T cells from, from the bone marrow. Let's see. Um, So I think I'll end here. We just mentioned that um, minor histocompatibility antigens, even if the host and the donor are matched, the HLA grafts may be slowly with minor histocompatibility difference. So, so survival of allografts or survival or incidence of graft versus host disease is reduced um, if there's complete allele match. So those red arrows show allele matching. Um, but survival goes progressively lower, or the incidence of graft versus host disease gets progressively higher if you have more and more mismatching. Okay. So I think um, I'm probably going to stop there. There's a few more slides that I talk about uh, T cell activation, but I think you can probably um, get the gist of that just by going through the slides. It's, it's essentially the same as, uh, as B cells. It requires two signals. Um, signal one is the antigen, which in this case is the T cell receptor in the MHC. Signal two comes from the antigen presenting uh, cell in the form of co stimulation. So the co stimulatory molecules for T cell activation are shown here. CD28 is on the surface of the T cell, <coughs> T cell and CD80 and CD86 are the co stimulatory molecules 
on dendritic cells that provide the second signal. So again, it's like, like B-cell, signal one. And um, I think we've seen this already, but there's all these different uh, effector T-cells that can differentiate from, from an activated CD4 T-cell. And that really depends on the, the cytokine <coughs> environment that the, the T-cell develops in to determine uh, which pathway it develops. Okay, um, I think I am going to stop there because we're going to talk about T cell B4. So we can stop here. So I ran over a bit there. Okay, let's stop there. Do you have any questions? Nope. Okay, good. Well, as I said, if you have any questions, you can always uh, shoot me an email. Or come and see me, and I'll do my best. A lot of information for <laughs> one morning, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, it, it, it goes in with the donor um, hormone. Okay. And so, <coughs> well, they, they, they just take it all. I mean, yeah, but they, they, they can be used in there. I mean, there are ways that you can flush them out. Yeah. Know? bad news because it means that those are those bear the allogeneic marker and they're very good at forming magnet cathodes and that's what happens all the dendritic cells in the lung get so exit get into the lymph node of the do of the host yeah uh, activate the host yeah and it's called those those ho those host because they you know they, they secrete the host of these T cells and then go back into the kidney and start killing the T cells and that's what happens okay
Aquí. Eh, ¿Cómo lo fallaste? 